Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and episode 33 part 1 of the Jimi Hendrix story like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we begin the deep dive into April of 1969, day by day and in detail. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page where you will find links to related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period. April 1969 would see the experience embark on their spring tour of North America, which would see them play 29 shows over the course of 10 weeks to a total audience of 350,000 fans, with a total take of over $1.3 million. In the manner that had become typical of their tours, most of Jimmy's time would be taken up by travel, doing press or promotions, or trying to cram in the odd studio session during a day off. By the second date of the tour, Jimmy was already complaining of exhaustion, and in his interviews, he was far more irritable than he'd been in Britain. He'd cut his hair and found that most journalists tried to ascribe some major significance to this. Crowd violence or gate crashes marred many shows on the tour, and racial politics also came into play when black power advocates would show up backstage and criticize Jimmy for using white musicians and a white promoter. Source Charles R. Cross. Charles. With the record plant's new 24 track room, really a 16 track unit with a separate set of electronics alongside it, booked solid, Hendrix was hot to record, and so instead, he checked into Olmsted Studios, an eight track facility in New York. Apart from taping an alternate version of Hear My Trainer Coming, on April 2nd with Buddy Miles and the Express, Hendrix recorded with his first all black trio essentially a cut-down version of The Express that featured Miles on drums and Bill Rich on bass. A number of demos were attempted with this lineup, including another attempt at Midnight Lightning on April 3rd and Trash Man on the 4th. From Olmsted, Hendrix returned to the record plant, and with April 11th, the first date of the experience's upcoming tour fast approaching, Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding had returned, and the line between recording with Miles and Rich, his band of gypsies, and finishing the fourth experience album Blurred, Although he had been unable to finish any tracks of late, Hendrix continued to record a torrent of demos of songs he had recently written. On April 6th and 7th, early versions of Lullaby for the Summer, a proto-Easy Eye Rider, and Ships Passing in the Night were committed to tape. And on April 6th, unusually Jimmy records a jam session on an electric sitar, an instrument given to him by its inventor, Vinnie Bell. Jimmy seems to appreciate this experimentation something which he will not really follow up on. Jimmy revisits Stone Free, his very first composition experience. This new version presents a more sophisticated arrangement than that of November 1966, the recording of which was used for the B-side of Hey Joe. Jimmy is happy with the group's progress. The guitar and vocal overdubs will be recorded during two subsequent sessions, on April 9th and 14th. During this session, Jimmy also worked on Hear My Train A Comin' without any muster tape being finalized. He also tried to improve Lullaby for the summer, which later morphed into Easy Rider. But as the tape boxes indicated, no finals were completed, another two compositions joining his growing pile of uncompleted work. The lack of technical and organizational support available to Hendrix, while he created in the studio, no doubt limited his progress and forced him to accept creative compromises. Source, John McDermott. And so we begin with, Tuesday the 1st of April. Hendrix is interviewed for Life magazine, published October 3, 1969, titled An Infinity of Jimmies. For the first time since February, the experience reunites in the studio, Olmsted Studios actually, this following an argument that occurred at their last Olympic Studios session, which resulted in Jimmy writing letters of apology to both Noel and Mitch. Noel Redding on Jimmy's note, after a particularly unproductive studio session, complete with shouting match, Jimmy sent Mitch and I a note apologizing for messing everybody around. It was a strange, touching letter which showed a side of Jimmy's character it was easy to forget existed in the mayhem of touring, recording, and drug-taking. In it, he wrote the kind of things we should have been able to say openly to each other once in a while, but didn't, because when you're leading a life that's a succession of drug-induced highs, you forget to lend some time to things like friendship and sympathy. Though he seemed aloof and spaced out, Jimmy was, as the letter showed, acutely sensitive to what was going on around him, felt strong affection for me and Mitch, as fellow musicians, and lived for the music we made. The Hendrix front was not just a defense for himself, 
It was also a way of distancing the band and the music from the media circus that now surrounded us at every turn. The pressure from outside was enormous, but maybe Jimmy felt his own internal pressure most. Pressure to innovate, to produce more and more brilliant music every time we went into the studio, to perfect everything we did. Jimmy's gentle, rambling, apologetic letter somehow conveyed all this. He admitted things had changed for the worse between us, and blamed it on the mumble-jumble that threatened to engulf us, the cynical, artificial environment of fame, a quagmire of superficiality, repetition and triviality. This was what was creating the emotional problems, despite the fact that we were basically a good, harmonious band, or should have been. I love you deeper than you could ever imagine, he wrote. Jimmy apologized for the fiasco of the previous night and admitted that he needed help and advice, just like anyone else. He ended with a plea, please help me, as I would love to help you, which I guess amounted to a plea for us to respect each other more and accept that we needed to work things out together. Hendrick's author, Sharon Lawrence, had this to say of Jimmy's letter. The camaraderie that Jimmy, Noel and Mitch had shared definitely appeared to be in jeopardy. Jimmy gave handwritten letters, respectful and from the heart, to Noel and Mitch as an attempt, he said, to keep things together. And although he didn't think much of Fat Mattress's music and wished that Noel had not pushed for his new group to open for the experience, Hendrix had agreed in order to keep it all cool, he said. Tuesday the 8th of April, Jimi Hendrix has a photo session with Richard Bush in a studio in Midtown Manhattan. Bush explains, we set up mirrors and had a group of women take off their clothes and be with him in this elaborate mirror image setting. It was a little wacky, but it was a lot of fun. Although it shows a glimpse of the psychedelic star's vivacity in the photo, Bush's interaction with Hendrix was different. He recalled, One thing that struck me was his shyness. His handshake was very gentle. This was in direct contrast to the wild man image he projected on stage. He struck me as a fragile person. Caesar Glebeek on the North American Tour The 1969 U.S. tour started on 11th of April in Raleigh, North Carolina, where Fat Mattress made their U.S. debut. That Jimmy didn't want to do the tour at all was clearly shown by his total lethargy when interviewed by a reporter, John Lombardi, from the distant drummer in Philadelphia, prior to what was only the second date on the schedule. Asked if he minded photos being taken, Jimmy replied listlessly, No, the same shit happens every day, so fuck it. Towards the end of the interview, annoyed with the questioning, he finally states, I didn't want to do this interview because I was tired and I never get any time to myself. I wanted to relax, write a song, but how can you say that to someone? This was the trouble. Jimmy never thought he could say it when plenty others in his position did. Fans would just go to his hotel room and meet him, which was great for them, and Jimmy was invariably polite. But he needed space for himself, and he never got it. For a musician of his status, the situation was just ludicrous. Noel Redding talking about Fat Mattress. Fat Mattress's upcoming American debut as occasional support band for the experience had my stomach in knots. It would mean that I would play as many as four shows some nights. I wanted us to be different. No wild stage act, no heavy lead guitar, no endless jams, no stars. We worked to create concise, melodic listening music, although Neil loved to whoop and shout in every break, during every solo and every ending. Mitch on the US tour. We started the last tour with Noel in Raleigh, North Carolina, on April 11th. We'd definitely been moved up to bigger venues by this stage, some we'd done before, but the whole tour was played in vast arenas. Yet again the sound in them was awful. We all preferred the smaller halls we'd been doing, where there was at least some chance of the audience hearing something, although they still seemed to enjoy it. However, the majority also seemed to want more equipment smashing and guitar burnings. It was all starting to wear a little thin, especially for Hendrix. The tour really was the same old stuff, right down to the same room service menu you'd seen the night before, in a different city. Here we were doing the same old places and an anger or at least an annoyance started creeping in that we still hadn't played in Japan or Australia or even South America. Boredom was setting in too and the only thing you can do to relieve it in terms of work is the recording studio. The problem is that as a band we needed that contact with a live audience. We were still enjoying the occasional gig but it was only the occasional one. Noel was getting involved with his own band, Fat Mattress. He insisted they open for us in Europe and they were doing so on this tour as well. 
I always thought it was strange, him doing that, and Jimmy resented it. Part of the problem, too, was that Jimmy was receiving very little direction from the management. Friday, the 11th of April, the Jimi Hendrix Experience performs at the Dorton Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina, supported by Fat Mattress, in front of an audience of approximately 9,100 people. Concert set list, Stone Free, Hear My Train Are Coming, Red House, Purple Haze, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe, Third Stone From The Sun, Manic Depression, All Along The Watchtower, and The Star Spangled Banner. The following promotional piece by Avon Privet titled A Hendrix Experience Awaits Crowd Tonight appeared in the, the Daily Tar Heel. Enter Hendrix, cocky and dressed in flashing colors, red and purple. When Purple Haze begins, usually the opening number, one can sense the vast power, electrostatic thunder, that is being unleashed. Hendrix drives hard and pounds away at the sounds of conventional rock. He makes use of the 400 watts of amplification and the more than 20 sun speakers. The volume is so intense that he can make numerous sounds on his guitar without even touching it with his left picking hand. He can tap it with his ring, and it sounds like Big Ben striking twelve. He plays with his teeth and nose, behind his back, over his head and between his legs, in his new famous crotch position. When he steps back from the mic to break into a riff, he arches up on his toes in a moment of supreme ecstasy. This area will finally get a change to be experienced. Tonight at the Dorton Arena at 8.30. Tickets are on sale at the record bar for between three and six dollars. Saturday, the 12th of April. The Jimi Hendrix Experience performs, with support from Noel Redding's band, Fat Mattress, at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. Before an audience of 14,000 fans, concert set list, Fire, Red House, Foxy Lady, I Don't Live Today, Getting My Heart Back Together Again, Stone Free, The Star Spangled Banner, Purple Haze, and Voodoo Child's Slight Return. On the Saturday afternoon of the show at the Spectrum, Jimmy was interviewed in his room at the Holiday Inn, at around 4 p.m. by writer John Lombardi. With the story published a week later in the now defunct Philadelphia alternative newspaper, Distant Drummer, April 17th to 23rd issue. Despite being tired, the ever accommodating Hendrix submitted to yet another interrogation. Jimmy revealed a bit about his state of mind regarding this interview when he was asked if he would mind being photographed. No, Hendrix replied. The same shit happens every day, so fuck it. Lombardi, who apparently was far from being an expert on Hendrix's music, as seen by his reference in print to the song Let Me Stand Inside Your Fire, started things off on a superficial note by remarking that Jimmy's hair appeared shorter than in his publicity photos. My hair, Jimmy questioned. I cut it short in protest. There are too many long-haired people running around whose heads aren't anywhere. But I think I'm going to grow it again. The interview continued to get off to a rocky start as the sore subject of the nude Electric Ladyland cover and Jimmy's image was brought up. I don't consider myself a success. I haven't even started yet, Hendrix told Lombardi. The scene puts you through a lot of changes. You get involved in images. I didn't have nothing to do with that stupid LP cover they released, and I don't even want to talk about it. It's mostly all bullshit. Lombardi proceeded to remind Jimmy about his stage act, referring to setting the guitar on fire going through the motions of intercourse. Not surprisingly, at this stage of his career, the question served only to aggravate Jimmy. We did those things mostly because they used to be fun, Jimmy noted. They just came out of us. But the music was still the main thing. Then what happened? The crowd started to want those things more than the music. Those little things that were just added on, like frosting, you know, became the most important. Things got changed around. We don't do that stuff as much anymore. The next topic broached was the obscenity arrest of singer Jim Morrison, following the disastrous performance by The Doors in Miami on March 1, 1969, when Morrison allegedly exposed himself on stage. Well, if it happened, it is flipped out, but I've only heard reports, Jimmy cautioned. I guess you'd have to ask Morrison about that. I don't want to talk about it. You know, we used to try to defend against some of the publicity, but we don't anymore. They just ignore what you say anyway, and the people who know where you're at know without asking questions. They know from the music. I dig music. Listen, Jimmy continued. You want to talk about music? That's what I really know about. I don't want to say nothing about comparisons with other groups, because if you do, that puts you higher or lower than them, and that's just the same old cycle. Our music is in a very solid state now. Not technically. Just in the sense that we can feel around the music and get into things better. We don't have any answers this time, but we'd love to turn everyone on to all we know. 
We know, for instance, that Jesus was starting to get it together quite nicely, but that Ten Commandments thing was a drag. The bogey man isn't going to come get you if you don't tie your shoe. You don't have to be afraid to make love to one of your boyfriend's wives. Brand name religions like Buddhism and Zen are just clashes. The Catholic Church is spreading and vomiting over the earth. The Church of England is the biggest landowner in England. Your home isn't America, it's the earth. But things are precarious, man. America could start getting together, and China or Russia could go, and we'd all be even heavier slaves. You know my song, I Don't Live Today, Maybe Tomorrow? That's where it's at. But I want to talk about music, Jimmy insisted. Things were getting too pretentious, too complicated. Stone free, you know that? That's much simpler. That's blues and rock and whatever happens, happens. People were singing about acid itself, man. Things start to rule you. Images, drugs, everybody forgets what happened to God. You know when you're young, most people have a little burning thing, but then you get your law degree and go into your little cellophane cage. You don't have to be an entertainer or anything to get it together. You can do the family thing. I've wanted to do that at times. I've wanted to go away to the hills sometimes, but I stayed. Some people are meant to stay and carry messages. You think of yourself as a messenger? asked Lombardi. No man, nothing like that, answered the offended Hendricks, who paused before speaking again. I didn't want to do this interview because I was tired, and I never get any time to myself. I wanted to relax, write a song. But how can you say that to someone? At this point, Jerry Stickles, experienced road manager, arrived to tell Jimmy it was time to get ready to leave for the show. Before ending the interview, Jimmy made one more point. Listen, I'm tired, but this is what I'm trying to say. If you prostitute your own thing, you can't do that. We was having a lot of fun with that stuff we used to do, but the more the press would play it up, and the more the audience would want it, the more we'd shy away from it. Do you see where that all fits? When I'm on stage playing the guitar, I don't think about sex. I can't make love when a beautiful record comes on. When I was in Hawaii, I seen a beautiful thing, a miracle. There were a lot of rings around the moon and the rings were all women's faces. Despite sitting in a room full of people, with an interviewer anxious to listen to anything Hendrix chose to say, Jimmy chose to indirectly refer to his own isolation as a rock star. I wish I could tell somebody about it, Hendrix said to finish the interview. Before leaving, Lombardi observed Jimmy speaking with a pretty black girl who was trying to get Jimmy to call her friend who was in the hospital. The hospitalized girl, a Hendrix fan named Beefy, received a 20-minute call from Jimmy before Hendrix and his entourage left for the performance. Jimmy Plays Philadelphia, commentary by Frank Moriarty. At the Spectrum, a large crowd awaited Jimmy's arrival. Ticket prices ranged from $3.50 to $6.50, and although the all-reserved seat show was not a sellout, 14,489 was the official attendance. The building was nearly full to capacity. In the next to the last row of the building was the author of this article, 13 years old and clutching an electric church concert program, full of pictures of Jimmy and company appropriately titled Electric Church as the church that my parents belonged to, in an attempt to connect with the younger generation, bought a group of tickets to the Jimi Hendrix Experience Show, and chartered a bus for transportation. I couldn't believe it when I heard about it, but I knew that this would be my best chance to go see the musician who was the dominant interest of my young life. I watched Noel Redding take the stage at the helm of Fat Mattress, and the band ran through material from their yet-to-be-released Fat Mattress debut album. The crowd received them well, although it was clear from the excitement in the air, that the fat mattress set was simply a precursor to the night's main event. As the stage was being set up for the experience performance, an MC took to the stage to talk to the crowd about the police harassment that was now common at the electric factory. Police Commissioner Rizzo had gone so far as to hold a press conference in front of the electric factory, vowing to turn this joint into a parking lot. With each new reference to the man hassling us, the crowd's intensity went up a pitch, and the spiel ended with huge cheers as everyone optimistically vowed that the police would never succeed in closing the electric factory. Soon thereafter, the lights went down to a roar from the crowd as everyone scrambled on top of their seats to get a better view. I had abandoned my seat in the rafters, taking advantage of the fact that I was just a kid to work my way past security and toward the stage. I reached the sixth row where a kindly girl let me stand on her seat so I could see. Beneath the spectrum seating, Jimmy emerged from the Philadelphia Flyers locker room, carrying his white Stratocaster with maple neck. Escorted by police and security, Hendricks walked through the tunnel toward the arena and ran the gauntlet to the stage. 
as at most of the concerts presented at the Spectrum in its first years of operation, the stage this night was located in the middle of the arena floor. The circular platform would slowly revolve throughout the concert, giving everyone a constantly shifting point of view. To a tremendous roar, Jimmy mounted the steps and walked onto the stage. I couldn't believe that Jimi Hendrix was now standing, not thirty feet from me, but the figure bathed in the bright spotlights left no doubt that it was true. With a blue headband trailing down, Jimmy was clad in an orange ruffled shirt and black vest and pants, a scarf tied around one leg. He smiled and greeted the crowd, and then Jimmy and Noel began tuning and equipment checks. All was in readiness, except for one thing. Where was Mitch Mitchell? Jimmy and Noel made small talk with 15,000 people, until finally Mitch popped up behind his gold drum kit. It was a large set, a big snare, joined by double-rack tom-toms, two-floor tom-toms, and two massive bass drums, with one emblazoned in script, Mitch, and the other, Mitchell, just in case anyone was uncertain as to who was providing the percussion. Though Jimmy had seemed so somber and introspective during his interview just hours before, now on stage his mood was bright. The band launched into fire, Hendrix working his effects and pushing his amps as he fed off of the crowd's energy. Jimmy capped off the solo with some quick guitar gymnastics, finishing the song with the inevitable pitch bends and clouds of feedback. The huge sound of the experience was rivaled only by the cheers of the audience. The stage was sliced neatly in half by the stacks of amplification equipment, and from my floor-level vantage point, I saw the experience half of the time, and black speaker cabinets stenciled JHXP the rest of the time. As Jimmy, Noel, and Mitch slowly spun back into view, Jimmy chose to slow things down from the frantic opening with a long journey through Red House. Hendrix put extra emphasis on the wait a minute something's wrong line and repeated it to dramatic effect before grabbing high, wailing bent notes as he worked the upper reaches of the guitar neck during the long solo. On this night, Red House followed a similar structure to the San Diego version that was recorded just a month later. Following the blues of Red House, Jimmy chose to make another radical shift in tempo, unleashing a long burst of feedback to usher in Foxy Lady. As Noel and Mitch fell in, Jimmy dispensed a hail of hammered notes, leading to the first verse. Jimmy finished the song with a long solo improvisation, unaccompanied by his rhythm section. Jimmy stepped to the microphone to introduce, I don't live today. We're just jamming. We haven't played in a long time. But the real introduction came via Mitch's lengthy and flashy drum solo, before he moved into the familiar percussion pattern of the studio version. Jimmy's lyrical delivery of the song was emotional, appropriately for a song that Hendrix often referred to in interviews as a reference point for his feelings. The guitar exploration in the song's middle section was a particularly intriguing sonic adventure, falling into a long section of eerie wails, and then a sped-up reprise. Nothing but existing, baby. All you're doing is existing, commented Jimmy, before he brought the song to a close. We'd like to do a thing called getting my heart back together again, Jimmy next announced. Then, remembering his conversation earlier in the day at the Holiday Inn, Jimmy added a dedication to little Beefy, who's in the hospital now, and her little friend. Hendrix ran through many variations based on the familiar opening riff, before arriving at a melodic section that consisted of long sustained notes that sounded similar to the theme of Midnight Lightning. Blues and rock and whatever happens happens, was how Jimmy had described Stone Free earlier that day, and this song made one of its relatively infrequent appearances in an experienced set as the next song the band performed. But it was an exceptional performance that was energetic and passionate, showing the experience was still a force to be reckoned with, in spite of the rumours of dissension. The pace was fast, with a long solo by Jimmy at the end, yielding to a percussive improvisation among all three musicians. A brief drum break led to more improvising along a descending pattern, followed by freeform jamming. Finally, Jimmy and company found their way back to the structure of Stone Free and brought the adventure to an end. Star Spangled Banner began next, but a long pause after the Oh Say Can You See notes left the crowd in doubt as to whether Jimmy intended to do the whole song or was just teasing as he was known to do on occasion. But the anthem started up again, following a stately structure quite similar to the famed Woodstock version complete with dive bombs. A major difference was that Jimmy used the tremolo bar heavily in this version for more vibrato on the verses throughout, and the short intro to Taps had yet to be added. But the ending was the same as Woodstock's, providing a gateway directly to Purple Haze. 
This night's driving rendition of one of Jimmy's most popular smash hits was crowned by a crazed solo that leapt and dived before it dissolved into roars of feedback. On long, bent notes of seemingly infinite sustain, Jimmy navigated back towards the song structure to meet up with Noel and Mitch for the finale. Jimmy stepped to the microphone and thanked us for coming, immediately crafting the introduction to Voodoo Child, Slight Return. Hendrix treated the song to the type of incendiary performance that he always seemed to reserve for this track, although this version was especially long. In fact, the entire performance at the Spectrum had been characterized by lengthy versions of Jimmy's songs. While the set list may have been shorter than at other shows, on the 1969 tour, the experience had more than made up for it by stretching out instrumentally to an even greater degree than usual. Jimmy left the stage and, surrounded by police once again, rushed through the barricades, protecting him from the crowd as he fled towards the dressing rooms. I made my way out to the bus, with ringing ears, and awed by what I had seen. Some of the others on the bus didn't seem to get it, but I had definitely been experienced. The image that I will always carry in my memory is one of Jimmy bathed in the hot glow of the spotlights, on his knees bent over backwards with the blue headband hanging down behind him, and his Stratocaster held up toward the sky as an indescribable wave of volume poured off of the stage. The show was reviewed on April 14th in the Evening Bulletin, one of the three major daily newspapers in Philadelphia. Writer Walter F. Nadel's review, titled Jimi Hendrix Fights with His Love Lady, offers a glimpse at the kinds of weird, impressionistic journalism accepted in those days, and shows that perhaps Mr. Nadel was writing as much from his libido as he was from his head. A black Apache backed by two silent Englishmen, Nadel wrote. Jimmy came on, blue silk headband flowing to his legs, scarves knotted at elbow and knee, a soft-spoken young man and his bad mouth electric guitar. Different from B.B. King's Lucille, the guitar became a woman Hendrix was love-fighting all night. To his wailing, she would shimmer back her own sass. As she built toward her screams, Hendrix would stagger back from the effort to get that much fight out of her. Sinking to his knees, holding her at arm's length while she ran off at him, he would at last draw her around him, fondling her, kissing her into submission. All that in ten minutes of Red House. All that in the first half of the review. The electric factory eventually did close a year later, although it was as much due to business reasons as from police pressure. That concludes this episode of the series. Stay tuned for the next installment, where we will continue the deep dive into April of 1969 and the Spring US Tour. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any photos, stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Until next time.